Have you ever been writing music or making something and then you realised, oh, that reminds me of something? Or you've taken someone else's idea and reworked it so it doesn't sound much like the original anymore? Yeah, I thought so. It's okay, it's easily done. And of course we don't feel all that great when we're doing it as well, especially when you consider copyrights well and all of it. But it happens all the time with covers of various songs and reworkings of movies, which are basically the same movie that came out like 20 years ago. It's also something the late film composer James Horner faced accusations of doing during his career. But what does that tell us about his work and creativity? And our creativity as artists, musicians, filmmakers and so on. You're watching Ranger on screen? And this is James Horner's story. Born in LA on the 14th of August 1953, and spending much of his childhood in London, James Horner was surrounded by creativity from a very young age. His father Harry was a celebrated set designer, and his brother Christopher a writer and filmmaker. Both his parents as well were Jewish immigrants, with his father from the old Austria-Hungary and his mother from Canada. Multicultural influences would have been part of his daily musical life then. He started the piano at five and he also learned the violin, receiving undergraduate tuition from the famous Royal College of Music and the Hamburg University of Music and Theatre. After returning to the States to complete his secondary education, he did a bachelor's in music at the University of Southern California and then went on and did a master's and started though never finished, a doctorate at UCLA, during what he described as the last gasp of modernism. But his passion for composing began long before. He described how during his time at the Royal College, he was sat at Holland Park School, listening to the famous second movement of Beethoven's Seventh Symphony. It really struck a chord within him, and when he went home and listened to it again and again and again, that's when he knew he wanted to be a composer. But it wasn't until he wrote a contemporary piece for orchestra that he felt failed to have an effect on the audience. Did he actually consider writing for film? He started writing music for student films and gained experience with B-movies during the late 70s, but his big break arrived in 82 with Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan. It placed him firmly in the top flight of Hollywood composers, and it led to further big projects such as Star Trek III and Alien, though the latter partly thanks to a previous B-movie score. Through the 80s and 90s he scored many family films such as Casper, Mighty Joe Young, The Land Before Time, How the Grinch Stole Christmas and many, many more. By 1995 though he'd also gained incredible demand writing for other genres, scoring six films that year alone. Two of which, Braveheart and Apollo 13, won Oscars. His score for those two films as well were also nominated for the same Oscar the following year. All this success eventually led to James Cameron approaching him for Titanic, which got him that Oscar for Best Original Score, as well as the one for Best Original Song with Will Jennings. And we all know how that one goes, so I won't mention it now, otherwise you'll have it stuck in your brain all day and that won't be fun however good it may be. Likely very good if it got an Oscar. Since then he's created a number of other acclaimed scores such as A Beautiful Mind, The Zorro Movies, Avatar and The Amazing Spider-Man. But of course, before he could release another two scores, in June 2015 the light aircraft he was flying crashed into the Los Padres National Forest in California, abruptly ending a wonderful life and career. Tragic as it is though, at least some comfort can be taken from the fact that he did achieve his dream of being a composer and he certainly achieved more than enough admiration and recognition to prove it. One of the criticisms laid at his doorstep during his life though was one of musical borrowing. Many accused him of taking excerpts from his earlier work and from other people's work and smoothing it into film scores enough to avoid legal ramifications. Very serious accusations for a composer. But as far as I can tell at least, none of the work he was said to have borrowed was contemporary other than his own. He's certainly not the first nor the last composer to reuse their own work. It's efficient and often a great way of evaluating your past efforts. And there's a unique kind of creativity needed, I think, when reimagining your own work and other people's work. You have to look past what it is and imagine what it could be. And criticisms of inoriginality, I believe, are highly misguided. Nothing in art, and certainly not music, is completely original. True inspiration is impossible in any area of life as well. It comes from drawing on various ideas of what we know of the world and combining and shaping those ideas into something new. Perhaps nowhere is this more evident now than in places like meme culture, where the point is to combine shared knowledge and create a fresh take on something. And if Horner's work does contain this borrowing, then it can hardly be surprising given his thorough and varied musical education. Nor can it take away from his talent. So if you've ever been worried about borrowing ideas in your art, then I would love to hear from you. How do you deal with those worries? Do you find it a help or hindrance when you create? 
If you enjoyed this video then don't forget to hit the like button and share it with anyone else you think might enjoy it. And if you're new here it would be amazing to have you subscribe so you can join us in our mission of highlighting the importance of music and film to the world.